pleasure to uh, introduce Professor Kanna from IIM Calcutta. He has been a professor at uh, Ministry of Management in Calcutta for quite some time now. He also serves in the boards of many uh, major uh, Indian corporations. So he has been working on the field of corporate governance for quite some time and also as a practitioner of corporate governance. So I believe today we will get to hear about his uh, research theory and evidence from India and also the stories that he can tell us about uh, his pra practice, pra practitioner of corporate governance in India. So over to you for a second. My work, um, which is a lot of it has been done with some of my doctoral students who have worked on on uh, business groups and so on. Um, in the presentation, I will keep away my experience from the boards out of it, okay, raising more conceptual and empirical issues. But when we have the question answers in the end, I'd be happy to answer anything that you may want to ask. Okay. Let me begin with by saying that. Uh, uh, this corporate governance is a hot issue for the last, shall I say, about two decades at least, if not more, and uh, often seen as a failure to contain the conflict between managers and, and shareholders, uh, especially at least in the literature, which is very popular in the United States at least, in the West. And uh, so if you were to look at Schiffler and Vishni is this thing, that it's the suppliers of finance who want to assure themselves that they get adequate returns. Um, so the problem is the separation of uh, control between ownership, uh, between owners and the managers who control the firms. Okay. So in the literature that is most popular, this is often seen as the agency problem. Uh, so, and the solution to this problem, we are very familiar with it, okay, which is what we teach in the classrooms, that you give the managers the right incentives, give them incentive or contracts or compensations, appoint independent directors, and that is the role I have been playing in some of the companies who are supposed to keep, be watchdogs and keep an eye on the executive directors. Uh, have other forms of institutional monitoring, okay, um, like the regulators and so on, and legal protection to minority shareholders, change your company law to provide for specific uh, protection. Uh, for example, the new company's law which we were talking about yesterday now has a provision that, uh, uh, that in all related party transactions voting, only the minority shareholders will vote. That being the people who are, who are interested in the thing, the, the, the people who control the block, large block, will not be allowed to vote. Uh, auditors' independence, uh, independent auditors were supposed to monitor. And of course, if everything fails, okay, then hostile takeovers are there to replace managements, which are, who are expropriating either shareholders' wealth or destroying shareholders' wealth through uh, mismanagement, either way. Okay, so this is the, the, the usual paradigm of what needs to be done. But in most other parts of the world, and I think the United States is an exception, uh, uh, corporate assets are controlled by what we call different forms of concentrated ownerships. Family being the most important uh, form, which is popular in Latin America, Asia, parts of Europe. But Europe also has other forms of concentrated ownerships, okay, including from financial institutions, banks, and so on. Uh, in this model, the promoter, we call it, the promoter management holds substantial stake. Okay. He is the largest shareholder. He also sits on the board. Uh, and uh, obviously, by investing, by staying invested in your own company, the owner goes the opportunity to diversify his own portfolio. So there is a cost associated with being a concentrated shareholder. Okay. <clears throat> uh, there will also be some benefits, you know, 
of, of private appropriation, some rents that you may get, and so on and so forth. We're not getting into this. So if the argument in the earlier period, as I had said, incentive contract compensation, game stock options is the kind of solution that they give. So here are the guys who already have uh, a substantial holding in the things. So the fact that they have concentrated uh, holding should diminish the agency problem, if not totally eliminated. Okay. I think if it's just clarificatory questions you ask, okay. otherwise we discussion we. So this deals with the agency problem as it relates to getting the agent to behave in my interest, but it does not do anything to address the impacted information problem. The agent may have superior information. No, right? exactly. yeah. yeah. We are not really discussing that. Okay. So does it mitigate the problem? Or does it lead to new kinds of problems? How do we characterize governance problems where dominant shareholder exists and the agency problem theoretically would, should be less in some sense. So uh, I think that the social and political setting of every country, every institution that shape it are crucial in determining the forms of control and governance that corporations follow. Okay, and uh, my effort today would be to demonstrate before you what has happened in India, how with the changing political environment and economic policies, how the governance and control structures have changed over the last two decades. That's what I'm going to talk about. So, to the Western scholars, the presence of these concentrated ownership of business groups is itself a mystery. According to them, it shouldn't happen there. And it must be because of some void. That means uh, um, institutional void. And once the institutions of capital market and, and governance and regulators come into place, this problem theoretically should disappear. Okay. Um, let me put it this way. Uh, the end point of all transition is to have separation of ownership and control the way you have it in the Anglo-Saxon world. At least the, if you read these authors, they think everybody will one day move towards the kind of structure which the United States has. But uh, I would argue that there has been a wide variation in, in governance structures, even in the Western countries, especially if you look at Europe, okay, where concentrated ownership has persisted despite okay, governance structures which would which would be which would be difficult to argue that there are voids in uh, in, in Europe, which is the reason for the concentrated ownership. Okay, so legal regulation, the institutions shape this constitutional uh, governance uh, forms or structures, and uh, they also shape the choices of economic actors, as well as organizational forms that develop. Politics and law also shape those structures. Um, regulation prohibiting banks, for example, and insurance firms from holding large equity was one reason why, if you read Mark Rowe, he would argue that this is one reason why in the United States you got this kind of dispersed shareholding with the absence of concentrated ownerships, which you get, for example, in Germany, where banks are allowed to hold uh, large amounts of stock. Uh, our framework says that similar to this kind of uh, frameworks, uh, Indian corporate control and governance structure which have evolved, have evolved due to the legal and political constraints imposed on business at different points of time. Changes in regulations and emerging global competition as the country has tried to integrate itself with global markets have changed the structure of control and governance in recent times. Okay. How this has changed, I will begin from a very early period, okay. what we call uh, the colonial period. Okay. As a matter of fact, long, long before there were capital markets or uh, 
countries like India. I don't know what what happened in England, in United States. How did the British invest here and exploit? Okay, in the 16th and 17th century, but at least in India, uh, the the investors in in England, Scotland, and so on, so forth, who wanted to exploit the colony, they would band together to invest in a country like India, and they would appoint an agent. Okay, and he was known as the agent or the managing agent uh, in that sense. And the system is often known as the managing agency system. And uh, so if you look at early forms of business organizations in countries like India, it is the managing agency system in which uh, European investors uh, were putting money and appointing an agent in India. These agency houses became the central hub that linked multiple enterprises and often behaved like business conglomerates. Some of them dominated entire sectors of the economy, in Indonesia, in Malaysia, in India, and so on. In many cases, the agency houses held the managing agency of the new companies without necessarily possessing a controlling interest. I'm sure most of you know, uh, at least some of you know, that uh, India was colonized by a company, you know, which is a joint stock company. It was not colonized by the British first. It was the East India Company which controls uh, the empire for 100 years. Because if you begin that, they entered Bengal in 1700, 1750s, something like that. Till 1857, till there is a large scale revolt in India. Uh, and the, the country is governed by a company. With the board of directors sitting in London and deciding how to exploit so the, so the managing agency system, which follows uh, after, the, even when the crown takes over, when the British crown takes over the colony, and, and uh, it is the norm how uh, the, the economic wealth of India is actually exploited. <coughs> you would find similar companies, they were East Asian, uh, uh, you know, East China Company and so on and so forth, Dutch East Indies Company. Uh, which was similar about it. So there is an early divorce between ownership and control in the colonial period without the development of capital markets. Okay. So if you read the modern literature, it says once you have capital markets, you will get this, uh, this thing. But I would argue that there can be many reasons why this divorce can happen. Uh, and I've just given you one example. Large scale misuse of these fiduciary powers by the managing agents. In, uh, they, for example, they charge a fixed commission or unit of output it was over production and loss to shareholders, but they would get their commissions. They were not responsible for the profitability. And uh, contracts were treated heavily in the favor of the agents who managed it. And they used lawyers to silence critical shareholders, including high lo lawyers in England, to threaten shareholders in England. Uh, it was abolished uh, after India became independent. This system con continued for some time and is abolished sometime in the mid-60s mid or late 60s. Okay. <clears throat> the abolition of managing agency system in India coincides with a sharp turn to the left in the Indian political and economic policies around the early 70s. Uh, part of it came from rising inequalities and discontent, something which is once again happening in India and China, both the countries. Uh, and of course, there was a lot of uh, talk about that the modern industrial strategy that the government has put into place has strengthened monopolies, private monopolies at least in many sectors, uh, which resulted government imposing very high uh, wealth and income taxes. Okay. By mid-70s, for example, the marginal rate of tax could be 95% at the, at the you know, peak, peak rate, rates. And it was possible for a, for a SSE to pay more than 100% of his income as taxes if you added the wealth tax. So if you combined the income tax with wealth tax, it was possible for you to have to pay more than your income. Theoretically, n not many people actually paid it, but in theory, you could at least be expected to um, this is also the period the government nationalized large sectors of the economy. Okay. Nationalization was a norm also in Europe, by the way, in the 60s, 
Harold Wilson, etc. Banks are being nationalized and so on. India also nationalizes banks, insurance firms. Mines were nationalized, especially the coal mines. <coughs> and um, certain sectors of the economy were reserved for public sector, for the state-owned enterprises, especially what was thought to be the core sectors, okay, electricity production, uh, mining, okay, um, steel production, and so on and so forth. Uh, the areas of investment which were also open to what, what, what came to be known as large business houses, LBH stands for large business houses, 20 or 30 families which controlled large enterprises. That was narrowed down that there were certain earmarked sectors where they were allowed to invest. They could not invest anywhere else. There was also restrictions on foreign firms. Foreign firms were asked to dilute the control and get Indian shareholders uh, on the board at least up to 60 percent. That means no foreign uh, firm would be able to control more than 40 percent of, of the company, okay. which led to IBM and Coca-Cola leaving India at that point of time. Okay. They, they pulled out of India because of this, these restrictions. Uh, <clears throat> what was the business response to these new restrictions and controls which came about? They begin in like late 60s and they're all in place by say 75. In the five or six years span of time, this nationalization takes place and new forms of control on the, uh, including changes in the Companies Act to give government greater power on these things. As far as the foreign firms were, con were, were concerned, they were asked to dilute their holding by selling stocks on the, on the stock market. And their effort was to ensure that these stocks went into to small shareholders. Nobody actually managed to control the thing. Especially they were reluctant. Uh, I'm sure you handled some of those FERA issues. Isn't right? Pradyut and me started as investment bankers around the time when the foreign firms were being asked to disinvest. And we handled some of those disinvestments on behalf of the banks we were working for. And, uh, the effort was to actually ensure that the government banks and, and uh, insurance firms did not underwrite these shares because if you, if you underwrote the shares, you would have a right to pick up some of those stocks. So these foreign firms did not want the government-owned banks to uh, pick up any stocks in them. They did not mind large, uh, uh, small shareholders buying those banks. As far as the Indian private sector was concerned, they were looking at innovative ways to avoid taxes and maintain control as well as guard against nationalization. All right. okay. An extensive use of charitable trusts became very common. Charitable trusts are still used extensively in India to control firms because they are exempt from, from taxes, usually. So you would say this, this is charity, and you would get yourself registered for, say, helping poor students with their education or something like that. And this trust would own the shares of the companies. Okay. Then I tell you some of the largest business groups in India, Tata's, for example, a substantial part of the empire is controlled by charitable trusts. Okay. What was the government's response to this? They said, okay, you guys are using charitable trusts. So they appointed somebody called a public trustee. Okay. He was a public servant. He could walk into any trust and exercise control over on behalf of the trust. Okay. That means he, he could say, it's your trust, all right, but I will vote today on your behalf. Okay. They also changed the company's law in which it requires government permission to appoint directors and fix remuneration. Okay. Every director had to be appointed by the company law board. <coughs> Public sector banks and financial institutions became very large shareholders in all private companies because they were stock market was small and they were underwriting and they were often uh, subscribed to your shares and they would appoint directors on your companies. So they would be government directors appointed by, uh, well not government directors, they would be from insurance firms or banks, but the, the banks and insurance firms were owned by the government. That's why the incidentally partly true today also. The banks and insurance firms are still largely owned by the government. Of course there are private sector allowed to enter the market. There were restrictions on intercorporate investments and mergers and acquisitions. 
this became much more difficult. You would require government's prior permission to invest from company A into B. And of course, the government had a right to take over management even without nationalizing you. Okay. That means they could just send a, a group of managers and say, you guys are out, this board of directors is out. We appointed a board of directors to run this company for this thing. This was not used, shall I say, um, to really nationalize anybody. It was often used when the companies were going sick or closing down or doing badly and the government wanted to save jobs. That is the time they would use it. Uh, the, the power still rests with the government. And if you heard about the big scam in India on a company called Satyam a couple of years ago, that is the time, the last time this was used. But they appointed government directors and sold the company to somebody else, to another private party, to save jobs. That was the only role that they played. But by and large, this was not. But theoretically, they have all the powers. They can, uh, uh, you know. Uh, <clears throat> so the Indian private sector's policies were shaped by what, what I'm calling licensing policy. You needed a license to even invest in certain sectors of the economy. You need an industrial license. So, and success in lobbying to, to be able to get those licenses. Uh, there were threats of nationalization and takeover by the government, and this would be a very, very important consideration how you would control your empires. Uh, there was also fragmentation of capacity between group companies. For example, um, the House of Birlas are known to have, say, so roughly a, a dozen cement plants, but each of them would be in a different company, often because of a tax breaks. For example, if an old company expands its capacity, you will not get a tax break. But if a new company starts a cement plant, you will get a five-year tax holiday. So there would be great incentive to go on setting up new companies and, and fragment the capacity. So some of these were to avail of tax shields that you got. But uh, so the con main objective is protect from government takeover, make sure government doesn't dislodge you from control, and try to reduce your taxes that you have to pay. Uh, um, things. So avoiding taxes, uh, where charitable trusts were very important uh, part of the game, and, and protect yourself from government takeover were the important things. And I, uh, there were two very popular models, what we call the linear model of control, which, uh, which is also associated with the House of Tatas. Uh, and there was a web model, which is associated with another uh, very large business group known as the Bridler. As a joke, people, uh, colloquial words, use the Tata model and the Birla model. But uh, this is not necessarily you know, exclusive to them. Charitable trusts are used as an instrument to own common stock and avoid high taxes. And also a large number of small unlisted investment companies. Okay. Sometimes you would go to an office um, and you would see 20 names written on a board outside. And it would just be in a man sitting somewhere. Eh? Uh, <laughs> been a, uh, you know, these are just uh, shall we, shell companies in some sense. They basically help you to control your empire in that sense. They just have only, and they just invest in your own company and so on. So I think in the total mo model, the control uh, of the companies was with minority shareholdings. That means. Tata's never had very large shareholdings in the, in the Tata companies. As a matter of fact, uh, sometimes they were abysmally low, as low as 3% of the total uh, stock. Uh, and depended on reputation, fair play, to get the support of other shareholders. Uh, they also, they, there was widespread use of charitable trusts to control older companies, like the Tata Steel. Uh, and then use of trusts and investment companies uh, and larger group firms to control other firms. So whenever you start a new firm, your family trust and the big companies would be the main investors. And rely on public institutions, public means government-owned institutions, to hold equity as they had promised not to destabilize if the management is good. That means if, you're, if you run the companies well, the government had declared a policy, it would not touch the management, it would not interfere. It would only interfere if it found the siphoning of money or, 
or something else is going wrong, this thing. Okay. And by 1958, the House of Tata's hold after only about a quarter of their own company in terms of shareholding. The rest of it is held by either government institutions or other private parties. This 28% includes their charitable trusts. Okay, remember that and what I'm saying. So this is like the model where the trust, uh, there are five or six large family trusts will become important, which control an investment company called Tata Sons. Even today, Tata Sons is a very important company. It's a mother company in some sense. And then uh, the, the first large company that they had set up was the steel plant. Okay, and then the steel had other investments below in, in, in Tata Electric Locomotive Company, which now is Tata Motors, and, and tube investments and so on and so forth, a large number of them. So th th in this model, there is one disadvantage. Suppose the government nationalized the Tata Steel, it would almost be able to control half the empire. Anybody who got hold of that one big company, which is large, because this big company would be a large investor in uh, other companies. This is totally avoided in the in the in the Birla model, the web model, where no one company is a direct subsidiary of another company. Okay. As a matter of fact, they use several small firms and private investment companies to control a majority stock. So every company would hold two or three percent in other companies. Okay, something like that. Making it difficult to determine the source of control. And uh, and nationalization of any one firm will not impact the control over other firms. That means you need five or seven companies to control a company, and if one company goes out of your control, it will not affect the control. As I said, the basic thing was make sure that you don't lose control over your empire, make sure that you don't pay high taxes that are being put into place. So this is roughly like this, in which Every company gets investment as well as invest back. So A will invest in B and B will invest back in A. It was a very common model uh, in this. And it's a whole web structure which will keep shifting around the year. Different points of time in the year, there will be these shareholdings will change. Okay, they would keep buying and selling. They, they would have a whole office managing this sort of uh, investment in their own, uh, own empire. So as I said, uh, the government had the power to take over control of private trusts, uh, and that could make uh, trusts, uh, charitable trusts, as the controlling mechanism vulnerable, and nationalizations could uh, could uh, endanger intercorporate investments and control. And the web model is is designed especially to avoid this in that sense. And of course, there were public financial institutions with large shareholding who could dis displace managements theoretically okay because they were the largest shareholders uh, till early 90s as a matter of fact who's the largest shareholder in all private companies it would be government owned banks and insurance firms something sometimes as high as 40 to 50 percent of the shareholding in some of these firms would be owned by banks which is true even today in some of the firms on managerial control firm, there are some managerial control firms in India heavily rely on government uh, institutions to, like Larson and Tubro and ITC and all, they, they, they depend on this thing. Now, uh, this is a quotation from, and this is the kind of discussion that I'm interested in taking, leading you to it here. The House of Tatas have very small control in their own companies, as I told you, you know less than a quarter percent of the total everything. And he's saying there's something there is something absurd that I have no other interest uh, than any other shareholder in most of the companies. We get the we get nothing extra for managing them, he's, he's complaining. Okay. For example, in nineteen seventy eight, ninety percent of my time was spent in Air India, which was by the way a government owned company. Air India was a Tata company which was nationalized, but Mr. Tata continued as a chairman for next 10 years or 15 years, uh, and Tata Steel as chairman both, and what do we get out of it? Okay, in Tata Steel, where they controlled only 3% of the share stock, so they were entitled to only 3% of the total dividends or profits. He said, I spend all my time managing this, and I get nothing extra out of it. Okay, 
the question we are asking is, is it true that they got nothing extra out of it? Hmm? Is what we are interested in. Okay, let me now shift to the 90s. In 90s, the government is deregulating, privatizing, opening up to the global economy, and so on and so forth. All licensing controls are abolished. Okay, income tax is lowered very sharply. It's much lower than the United States today. It's just m highest rate is 30%. Foreign investment is welcome in most sectors of the economy, except you know armament production and uh, things like those. Almost everywhere it's allowed. All trade restrictions are restrictions on foreign trade were phased out. Exchange controls first reduced, now abolished. That means you can. Uh, and of course, foreign investors are welcome into the stock market. And uh, there's also an end to, f there were development financial institutions which used to fund large projects in India at subsidized rates. And all that is being abolished. That means uh, and India had a long policy of, of uh, subsidizing uh, long-term investments, uh, which has now gone during the years. Uh, and there were other kinds of uh, directed credit, which is still in place, by the way. For example, the banks have to lend at least one third of the total lending must be to small firms and to exporters. Okay. And if, you, you can't, if you're not able to in, put that money, you pay a penalty. Or, or you put that money to a government-owned bank, which will then lend only to small firms and so on and so forth. So some of those are still in place, but, by, but that, and that applies to both private banks, foreign banks. Anybody who works in India has to put 30% of the money for small enterprises. Anyway, <clears throat> there's also an effort to shift from bank funding to capital market funding. And in response to pressure from the capital markets, uh, banks and credit rating agencies, they are asking for more transparent forms of corporate control. Okay, all these investment firms, charitable trusts, everybody starts to ask questions about this. Uh, the also collapse of, uh, you know, lots of Indian firms had foreign partners, had joint venture partners. Almost all of them broke up. Either foreigners bought out the Indians or Indians bought out the foreigners. Okay, this uh, joint venturing actually collapses in the mid, mid, mid 90s, partly because foreign firms themselves become interested in the Indian market. Earlier, I needed a partner to enter India. I was not allowed to enter alone. Now that I can enter alone, maybe I will just come on my own. And there's a produce pressure to reduce intra-group investments as financial analysts and foreign investors disapproved of this diversion of funds, what they thought to be diversion of funds. Okay. So company A investing into B was frowned upon, at least by foreign investors. And they, they, when they first came to India, they were uh, they are putting pressure on, on these family-owned firms to, to get rid of this. Okay. Let me just show you what has happened over the years. This is 90s and this is, I'm taking you to end of the, of the decades. Uh, th these are state-owned enterprises, government-owned firms, public sector firms. Okay, they still dominate a large sector of the economy. Uh, though everything is open to private, you know, private sector is free to enter everywhere. You can see the share has come down from roughly about 50% to 30% of the total assets still owned by them. Okay, roughly 30, 40% stock market capitalization is also government owned firms. Many of them are listed on the stock market. And, uh, and this blue is the Indian business group. You can see their share has sharply gone up. So this has gone up from roughly about 30% to 45%, 42% if you like to put it. Uh, these are the foreign firms. Their share hasn't changed much. Are they interesting? Because uh, one would have expected them to do a little better. And these are what I call independent standalone firms, which are not part of the business uh, groups or families. Lots of them professional firms. Lots of them, I was just telling, uh, you know, Silicon Valley entrepreneurs going back to India, starting up software firms and all that. All of those would be uh, the biotech firms, all what we call new generation entrepreneurs uh, and, and doing this kind of thing. 
That was the manufacturing sector. If you look at the non-financial service sector, again you find that the government share has come down. Government dominated the telecom sector, for example, for the state monopoly and the airlines, and all of those are really have gone down. Okay, yeah, very sharply. And the private sector in services at least has become big, much bigger than the state-owned sector, especially in telecom, airlines, and most other service sectors. I don't think government dominates any service sector, does it? I don't think so. Uh, they are still there, but. Uh, So <clears throat> last two, two decades have seen a fundamental shift in the corporate structure and control, and this is what I'm going to talk about. There is a relative decline in the share of state-owned enterprises, though autonomy and freedom given to them also, okay, much less controls on them also by the ministries and so on. Many of them become very large, powerful international players. The largest foreign investment from India comes from state-owned enterprises, just like China, especially in the petroleum sector, coal sector, and so on and so forth. There is a rise of new entrepreneurs, which I was telling you about, those new firms and standalone firms. Okay, many going back from the United States, many people who worked here and going back and starting firms, often linked to Silicon Valley, and as well as biotechnology, telephone industry, and so on and so forth. And of course, there is a rapid expansion of some several old business groups, like the House of Tata's, Mittal's, and Van Baxi's. Tata's would be today the most international of all business groups. They are the largest investor, for example, in the United Kingdom. They are the largest employer in England. Okay, is the House of Tata's. Uh, <clears throat> what has happened? How have they done? Remember. With the reforms, the government has also allowed hostile takeovers. Huh? Mergers and acquisitions are easy. There is a regulator in place. Foreign firms are allowed to enter. So all that has, has come into this thing. Which means family control is very small shareholding, 3 to 5 percent. If you have that kind of a holding which you had in the, in the 70s and 80s, today it would mean you would certainly lose control over the firm. So there is a third what I call pyramidal structure to be strengthened. Tata family owns equity in its core affiliates, Tata Industries and Tata Sun. These are private companies you know, owned by the family, which are not publicly traded. And majority of the stake in this firm is held by 66 trust, charitable trusts, held by family members. Okay. The Tata Sun's right issue was a crucial step. They had a rights issue to raise money, okay. And the trust did not take the rights issue because they didn't have the money. So they they sold those rights to other group firms. So the group firms gave money back to Tata Sons, and Tata Sons used that money to buy into the group firms. So it's, it's like total tunneling, if you want to use that word. Company A putting back into the mother company, mother company now. So Tata Investment Corporations now hold 10% in Tata Chemicals, Tata T by Tata Chemicals, holds 15% in Tata Investment. Can you see that? So A invests in B, B invests back in A. Tata T holds 4% in Tata Chemicals, and Tata Chemical holds 8% in Tata T, and so on. So this has become a little bit like the web structure. In India, Indian companies' law, the crucial number is is 26% control. Because in India, super majority uh, or most resolution requires super majority provision. And you need to get 75% votes to pass anything except accounts. Any major change that you want to do, any restructuring you want to do, you need 75% vote. So if you have 25%, it's enough to block any, any major resolution. Enough to control a company, let me put it this way. So the first major effort of Tata's is between the period early 90s to 2005 is to make sure that each of their control goes up to at least 25% and above. And Tata Steel was 3%, as I told you, 
it has become 26 percent. Tata Motors was 14 percent, it has become 32. Tata Chemicals, they have reduced here. Why? Because there is no advantage in having 35. Beyond 26 doesn't matter. If you need money, you just take it out and put it somewhere else. Similarly, Indian Hotel, 62, they have brought it down. And uh, Tata Oil Mills, which they sold off to somebody else. Electric, which had 1%, Tata Power, which is now you know, changed, and became 32%, Tata T, again like that. This is just showing you cross investments. All the red lines show you investment in group companies. So this is equity investments from one Tata company to another Tata company. This is uh, preference shares. This is debt instruments, bonds, etc. This is investment in group mutual funds, uh, these things. And total cross investments is what you get there in, um, what's it, crores, no? One crore is 10 million, roughly. So it's about, uh, OK. And you can make out that in 91, the cross investment is only 2% of the total assets. It becomes roughly 25% of the total assets by the end of the decade. Sharp increase in intergroup investments. Okay. And the whole web structure is meant to ensure that it's safe from takeovers, at least hostile takeovers. That's one of the things. There are many other uses of this cross investment which I'll come to. This is actual mapping. One of my doctoral students, Kakani, he has done each company's investment in every other company. He has mapped it. This is for a year 2005. Okay. So it looks like a web structure. For example, it shows Tata Sun's investments and this, 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 this. I, can you see that? And like that. So which company is investing in which? You read, you read each balance sheet and they give you, they are, they are forced to disclose this. This is all done publicly, by the way. Nothing is hidden. It's all disclosed to shareholders every year. They even announce sometimes that they are raising money to invest in other group companies. So it's done in the most transparent manner with the concurrence of the shareholders. OK. The group has increased its indirect holding over, over its affiliates. It is also consolidated found in similar businesses. They merged some of the businesses which were similar. The ownership pattern of key affiliates is becoming more dispersed. That means number of holding companies has gone up. Instead of one company controlling another company, there are several companies that are controlled. Apart from the primary holding company, which is Tata Sons, uh, there are many other group control entities which are part of this complex structure. Okay. These are some names that you can see. They are investment firms. And then there are, of course, these are the trusts, okay, family trusts, which are the major forms of control of exercising in the groups. Uh, in some affiliates have cross investment in each other by owning them singly or jointly. And the group has control over all these entities with lower cash flow rights. My control rights are higher than my cash flow rights. They diverge very sharply. But the Tata Group is using the independent shareholders' money to increase Tata Sun's stake in its company itself. Consequently, Tata Sun uses this money to increase stake in other companies. About 24% of all the assets are investments in group companies. So when the Tata say, I empire so many billion dollars, you should take out 24%. Because that is just A investing in B and is double counting in some sense. All firms act as investment vehicles. If they have good cash flows, weaker firms are supported. As a matter of fact, without this, using this whole web structure as an internal bank, Tata's would never have been able to acquire the kind of companies they've acquired abroad. For example, the tea company acquired Tetley's brand. The, the year they acquired, the value of the brand itself, what they paid, was four times the total turnover of the Tata tea. And how would you pay for it unless your other group companies supported you? 
Tata Steel took over Chorus, which is a large European steel firm. Tata Steel's own capacity was 4 million tons. Chorus capacity was 28 million tons. How would a small company take over such a big company? And who would fund this? Of course, they were borrowing from outside, but a large part of it came from other group entities. So all the group firms will help you when you are acquiring a target by, uh, by uh, financing you in some sense. And when your opportunity came, other firms would finance you. So the whole web structure actually operates like a giant, shall I say, um, investment uh, trust or a bank or whatever else is that you know, want to call it. This is, they are not the only ones in India. Almost all business groups in India have repeated the thing. I'm just giving you some examples, but you can measure this. This is the house of Birlas, one of the most successful branches of the Birla family. As you can see, they had, uh, this was only 0.2% uh, in 91, cross investments. It has become roughly 14%, 13% now. Okay. Similar increases in, in, the, in the assets. And these are, these are different other groups. Since you're not familiar with the names, they are among the top 20, 30 business families who control the empires uh, and this thing. And each of them you can see a several, several times increase in the cross investments. Some is much more than others, but cross investment has been a major form of, ex of enhancing control o over those firms. Okay. And the question to ask is, this this kind of governance problem leads to a conflict between one group of shareholders, what I call the insider, and the other group of shareholders. Uh, the pyramids and cross holdings are used at different points of time. But the question to ask is why do minority shareholders agree to such a structure? I invest in a company A and my money is taken out and put into company B, C and D. Without my permission, why do I uh, allow this? Okay. <clears throat> Can we conclude that they, this was their consent or were they willing participants in this? If so, what did they get in return for this? What do minority shareholders, whose money is being used to control the empire, okay, who have the cash flow rights with the control rights go to the house of Tatas, what are they getting in return? Okay. Okay. So one way of looking at it is to argue that in countries like India, there are ill-defined property rights or intangibles. And reputation, name, etc., is an intangible. Okay, associated with the family name and reputation of the business firm. The Tatas would argue that because of our governance and reputation, we are able to borrow at lower rates of interest, for example. And the advantage goes to all shareholders. Okay, uh, and I don't get anything extra. That is what the head of the family was complaining. That I am just like any other shareholder. I only get 3% of the return because I have nothing else to do. The reputation reduces the cost of writing and enforcing contracts and has economic value. One way of looking at it. Benefits and rents associated with these intangibles belong to the controlling shareholder, enjoyed by all the shareholders, who bring nothing to the table except money. So I'm having an exchange. Let me tell you, when the Tata started this, there was a lot of criticism. They had a PR agency to explain what they were doing. And since then, they have publicly announced and explained what they will do before they make their rights issue. So it is not done in a clandestine manner. If you don't want to subscribe to the shares, you can give up your rights issues. Okay. So nobody can accuse them of doing this without the concurrence of the shareholders. Okay. Some other group might have not have taken, but they actually publicize it. They call the analysts and tell them, this is what we are going to do. 
will you enhance the control from this to this? Okay. And, uh, this is our strategy. This is our business plan. Each company will have at least so much percentage control. This is our five-year plan, and we're going about it. If you have any questions, ask. If you don't want to invest, don't. So one has to accept that the shareholder must be getting something in return for this. And this return could be either the economic value. Okay. The reputation also signals superior governance, better control of strategy and policy, better control of agents, of managers. Okay. And my favorite example, at least from the House of Tata's, is that they had a Tata Finance company called Tata Finance, whose chief executive actually swindled the company. Okay. And the Tatas actually called in the police, got him arrested, told the regulators, but the shareholders have lost their money through a fraud. Okay. And they compensated the shareholders by merging a family owned finance company with this company. That means my job was to look after your interests, to, to control the manager on your behalf, the agent. I failed in my duty. I'm compensating you for this. Now, that is the ultimate test of the reputation, that my reputation is more important than losing a couple of billion dollars uh, to be able to compensate you. It's a very famous Pense case. If you do it, it's the Pense case. You, you do a Google, you'll get the details of the case on the website. Okay. What is unclear, how the value of the control rights and rights to direct managers, uh, how do I value this? Are you with me on this? So there is something they are giving in return. Huh? Agency problem does not disappear. Agent is controlled by the, by the constituted shareholder. Mr. Tata, he acts on behalf of, he acts as a principal on behalf of other small shareholders who don't have time to monitor. That's what we expect institutional uh, concentrated shareholding to do sometimes, isn't it? If, hmm? We lament the fact that in, in USA institutions, though they hold pension funds and all that, they hold large stocks, they don't do this monitoring. But here is somebody who is willing to do the monitoring for you. So this is an informal uh, and internal market for control rights that are exchanged for cash flow rights. You get your cash flow. I get to control the company, okay, and we are exchanging it in that sense. The value of these intangibles are strong. The market will tolerate such arrangements. Where it's weak, the market will penalize such firms. Not every family gets away with this. That's the other point we are trying to make. Okay. As a matter of fact, shareholders have punished many families for this kind of tunneling and siphoning. I won't bother to show you the results, but there are different measures of, we have tried to link up with reputation and the returns that you get. There were some surveys of reputation with business magazines carry on, which is the most reputed uh, family or business house and so on. If in, in interest of all shareholders, that the majority of non-family shareholders may agree to disproportionate control by a controlling shareholder, Thus allowing controlling shareholders the benefit of diversification and offering outsider shareholders benefit of appropriate monitoring. Why does a small shareholder agree to it? Because the big shareholder is monitoring the agent on his behalf in some sense. And as long as I think that monitoring is good, I get good returns, I am willing to accept it, let him do what he wants with my money. <coughs> Our analysis takes business with reputation from a public survey to measure that tells us whether the cost of raising resources from the market for a business house is correlated to re reputation. Okay. In the survey, in the business houses were ranked according to reputation with Tata's at the house, first house. This makes a, helps us to make a sense of governance problems and possible trade-offs faced by different stakeholders. So this is the rankings. You know, the, the, we have tried to work out the Tobin's Q for the, the families for whose data I have shown you recently, just now. And uh, a high Tobin's Q would imply that 
that the stock markets, uh, despite this increasing control uh, tunneling which is happening, the Tobin skew has been rising in some sense. That means the, uh, this is another uh, reputation and cost of equity or implied cost of equity capital that we try to calculate. This is again a ranking of the business group in that survey, the 10, and you can make out that the cost of capital varies with reputation. People with lower reputation would have a higher cost of capital, which is actually borne out by this empirical uh, study. But uh, so Indian business groups continue to raise resources from the market. Market have come to accept this cross investments, including foreign investors. Foreign investors are very large investors in Indian stock market. Roughly 30% of all market capitalization is now owned by foreign institutional investors. Tata shares are among the best performing in the stock market. Tata is open and blase about using cross investment to diversify and expand abroad. As a matter of fact, they have used this uh, uh, resources from other group companies to acquire firms abroad, without which the internationalization strategy would have never taken off. Okay. This con consistent with all this Laporta's paper which says weak investor protection, shareholders may rely on a group, uh, allows them to hold large controlling stake disproportionate to their investments, to exercise powerful control mechanism to counter exploitation by managers, agents. I stop here and I open for questions. Firstly, if there are any clarificatory questions on in case I went very fast, how we calculated what, okay, or those kinds of things. If any of you have students have any questions, I'd be happy to answer. And conceptual and theoretical arguments, yeah. So the argument is I think I heard is that the minority shareholder when you get some sort of implicit return. Yeah. Are you sure it's not an explicit return? Um, you know, I think about a company like Tata um, with the reputation it has and the ability it has to uh, attract capital. Uh, I wonder if the minority shareholder return is it actually in some way it is explicit. I, 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 uh, well, then I misunderstood you. I, I said that the reputation is not properly valued. There is no way of. So, you know. so, it, so the reputation has an explicit value yeah. to, the, to the minority shareholder. Yeah. It's an implicit value. Yeah. Okay, I, I took that wrong. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. What I would like to do is, uh, first of all, um, we have a few students here. Um, some of these slides would be very useful. So, for example, when you were showing the slides with the cross folding when we teach consolidations, for example, or, you know, how to come to public charts like that are very useful. So I would wonder if you would be uh, open to sharing this slide. Absolutely. No, yeah, I, I just left you on the desktop and right. you can just take it. Yeah. Thank you. And the other thing I had for the students was uh, that if you have questions about the Indian business context and you can sort of see how this whole thing has evolved over a couple of centuries, um, feel free to ask for background questions as well because very often uh, you may feel like if I had more background, I'd understand it better. So feel free to ask questions about that. And I think students should get a chance first to ask questions. Others will get data. Yeah. What caused the shifts in the 1970s and uh, 1990s politically left and right uh, nationalization and deregulation? See, there, there is a period uh, in the 60s where even European countries are nationalizing banks and all kinds of things. Okay. Wilson in England, for example. France is doing similar things. There's a whole tendency that greater government control is needed on. In India, it was felt that <coughs> private sector was supposed to be very weak. Hmm? Uh, national savings are very low. When you become independent, they're five percent of GDP only savings rate. And, uh, and India realized that it needs to raise its savings investments rate. And the state took upon itself to invest. State also tried to provide funds for private sector through those development financial institutions. Industrial Development Bank of India, 
It was a very large bank. It was next only to World Bank at one point of time in terms of lending. It almost lent to every large enterprise in India. Okay. So because the capital markets are weak, there is no savings, in, institutional investors are small. So the government was, from its from his tax money, was putting out into a development bank and also funding private sector. Okay. But it was also reserving certain areas for state enterprises. Because it said, it's my money, if, we, if it's coming out of share, people's taxes, it has to be owned by people to the parliament. Okay. So that was one set of things. And why India turned left? There are always, always, there are always a political context. You know, there's a contestation taking place. Isn't it? Right now we are going into elections right now. Okay. And there is a very sharp polarization in India today. Almost like what happened in the 70s. Today it's a right wing party, a nationalist party trying to win elections. At that point of time, that woman who was heading the Congress party, through nationalization, through showing that she will get rid of poverty and all that, okay, won the election. And one promise was that she will control these big monopolies, private monopolies, and she nationalized some of them. So there is a specific political context in every country, just as there is a political context in the United States. Okay, when that act comes, Sherman, this act comes and segregates banks' control from firms. Okay. Although what Morgan did is no longer possible from late late 20s and early 30s in the United States. You understand what I'm saying? So there's always a political context why it happens. And by 90s, Chinese and everybody is opening up so that India reverses the policies. The government is practically bankrupt in the 19, uh, early 90s, right? Late 80s, early 90s. There's yeah, a huge foreign exchange crisis, balance of payments, problems, all kinds of things. Government bankruptcy is never an issue to me. The United States government has been bankrupt for a long time. All through Reagan era, borrowing heavily from abroad. Governments are, you know, government have right to print. <laughs> so I think government bankruptcy is very different. But you are right, there was a foreign exchange crisis. Country was not able to export enough. And country was importing massively. Okay. And uh, there were all kinds of distortions in the policy. It's very clear that. So India has emerged as a big exporter after that. You know, and, uh, which we couldn't export in the 70s and 80s. There's no reason why we couldn't. If we could do it in the 90s, we should have been able to do it in the 80s. Yeah. So beyond that, it's a very complicated story. You have to know the politics of the country to follow at each juncture what happens. So, so in that general follow-up that might also help students, or as many of us better understand the context, what's your perspective on the whole protections philosophy uh, for a nascent economy, a developing economy? As you said, capital markets were weak, savings rates were low. The British had used India as a colony for a couple of hundred years, so we were not nearly as industrialized in time of independence. And in that context, the government had a policy of self-reliance and also of protectionism and protecting industries. How has that affected the, 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 the sort of development of Indian capitalism? And how is that played through today? See, India acquired a very diversified industrial base with that policy. Don't underestimate, I mean, uh, and at that point many of them looked uh, inefficient. But looking back on it, they are very efficient. They are competitive, buy the electricals and all that. Okay, they would be one of the cheapest producers in the world today in many of those industries. Um, so India did acquire, I think it was not a failure, I think India had a very successful industrial strategy, which actually laid the foundation of what has happened in the 90s. You wouldn't have been able to do this kind of a thing. As a matter of fact, I have another paper on, on state-owned enterprises, why they are doing so well, suddenly. Okay. Today, the largest investors in the economy are state-owned enterprises. They are sitting on 3 lakh crores of investments. And uh, when this slowdown is taking place, the finance minister's main job is to tell these Last 20, 30 enterprises invest, invest, so the investment uh, is up. And a lot of it is because product market prices have been deregulated to allow private entry. Private sector wants to enter, say, electricity generation or something like that. So they are asking for liberal pricing of those assets. If you do it, lib gas pricing is a big issue in India. Reliance has discovered some offshore gas, and they are asking for $8 for whatever that. 
million cubic uh, meters or whatever. And the ONGC, which used to get for two dollars, they will also get eight dollars. So their profitability will go up sharply. So if when you give the same prices to public and private sectors, I think you find this thing. One is the state-owned enterprises. Second is even in the um, private sector, whole new set of entire pharmaceutical industry is a result of India's not accepting the patent law and not accepting and pro giving protection to domestic firms, including reservation that the government will buy only from domestic firms for government hospitals and so on and so forth. It actually laid the foundation of a very strong pharmaceutical company uh, industry, which is today a global player in some sense. So I think Chinese also have a similar story to tell. It doesn't mean that all were successful and all were efficient. Some were, I mean, in China's case, maybe more than half were inefficient. In our case, similar half would be inefficient. And the other half is what laid the foundation of the new growth strategy. Now, I'm speculating. It has not declined so far. That's all I will say. It has been enhanced in the, way, in the, in the recent past. But it may decline. Has it been going up? Been I think it, it went up in the 90s because once the market opened up. All right. So I, what I have in mind is in the, in the 90s, clearly, it went, you know, it went up. Yeah. And so did it just go up and stay up? Or did it come down? Or is it going to go up and sort of gradually come back down? If you believe, if you believe all these guys who talk about institutional void, they will say it will come down. Well, that's kind of what the theory would say. To that the theory would say to mine. So I'm not so sure. Yeah. I'm not so sure. You see, because you have to look not only at India, you have to look at European countries also, where this divorce between ownership capital has not taken place. This kind of dispersed shareholding, diffuse shareholding, hasn't taken place in Germany and many other countries. Okay. They have all the institutions, uh, they have all the capital market uh, and everything uh, in place. Uh, so there would be other, my favorite author is Mark Rowe, you know, from Colombia. He actually talks about, there are political determinants always, partly, and there are always country-specific institutions and ways of governing. For example, in England, for, for example, Germany, workers have a large say in the governing board, you know. They have number of seats, sometimes half. Banks always have seats on the board, okay, which is not, uh, no worker, no trade union would have seats in uh, any US corporation, which actually leads to a different kind of stakeholder interest in the company. Okay. And governance, what varieties of capital, which are called patient capital, you know, capital which is not in a hurry to get returns, which actually looks at long term perspective and returns. Reputation matters there. But if the dispersion of reputation were to decline, so that over time, more and more companies would come to have a, a good reputation, Yes. Um, and the one with bad reputation would fall off because they would fail, yes. then the value of reputation should decline. Should come down. That. Should come down. If there, is, if there are a lot of firms like that who are able, as well managed, the value would come down. I agree with you there. You know, very interestingly, foreign firms used to have a higher uh, Tobin's queue earlier. Today they have lower in Indian markets. Because they have been accused of being unfair to Indian shareholders. Okay. They have started, because there are no restrictions, they give large amounts of royalty and payment to their parent company, which has become a big issue in India. That they are stealing money from shareholders here for adding no value. Okay. 
and their value, their market capitalization, price earning ratios are lower than houses like Tata's. At one time, it was just the reverse. Early 90s, the foreign firms had the best reputation. Those listed in the stock market had the highest uh, turbine skew, had the highest price earning ratios, and so on and so forth. It has gone down because of this persistent policies. Secondly, many of them have started, when, when they get a new profitable opportunity, they set up a 100% on subsidiary and cut off the Indian shareholders. Now, that is another very big contention issue. Okay. That you used us to enter the Indian market, and now that when you are solid and you get new opportunities, you keep us out. So Indian shareholders are very upset. Yeah. So it, it seems to me, I, I want to take an opposite and perhaps uh, not so intuitive tack on interpreting the lens through which I'm hearing the results. And perhaps this is painted by my familiarity with this dealing with this industry also. What I see the data is a refined version of the managing agency. I thought it was very interesting that you started with yeah. that. And what they have done is by being a minority shareholder and by consciously remaining a minority, they have in effect put out a new kind of commodity, which is the representative shareholder. They are the representative shareholder. They stay generally a small family. And most of the time, they don't employ family members in various branches of the business. They don't have? They managed. And so what they do is they act as a representative shareholder. And they act as a general monitor. And their expertise lies bringing in this kind of hands-off oversight where there is no question of the Tata family itself tunneling money out of Tata companies. That is something Tata has never been accused of. No. Builders have often been accused of lining their own pockets at the expense of the minority. Yeah, it's an exceptional exceptional group. I will, so I will keep them been, out. I will right. keep them out from right. the story. So the Tata's of all the groups yeah. have perfected this. See, actually order. Tata's don't have children also. Yeah. No, no male, males, no more. Males so they have been adopting people to take over and run the business. Mm -hmm. So it's a very interesting family, which is not really a family, it's just a name and reputation. That's right. Okay. And now they have got somebody from another family. Yes. Who's the running female heirs can't take over the business. Pardon? The female heirs cannot take No, they can't. They're not even females, you see. It's uh, the last head of the family was not even married. Yeah. And uh, they are from a minority ethnic group from Iran called the Parsis. And because they intermarried, they have a lot of genetic problems, the whole, the entire community. And they're very declining, very sharply declining numbers. They're very creative people, writers and poets and Zubin Mehta, that, that, that uh, orchestra. All these are from the same small ethnic group. But, uh, so that's an exception. Let's leave them out. So it seems to me that the Tatas have almost perfected this economic commodity called governance. And they act as your representative. They are, in effect, the old managing agency without many of the problems that you identified with the managing agency. They bring knowledge of business structures. They bring knowledge of management. They act as selection functions, basically. Firstly, I would argue many others do it. That is not the only one. But they are the first to. They, 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 they were the ones who pioneered right, that, right? Even back in the 70s, when Lucy Mohi and others <coughs> were selected to run Tata Steel and Tata T and, and all of those. So they have some, they bring to the table this history. And oh, this good reputation, yeah. Right. And they know how to run businesses. They're, 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 they're just about as smart at running businesses as any other business group in India, right? Yes. Well, uh, that, that is not saying much. I mean, okay. you, know, uh, you know, who can run, who can, many of the companies did very badly. So it's not that always they were good and successful. That's not true. You know, and they just sell off some businesses. Okay. And they sold off to rivals when some of the group managers protested. Okay, for example, Darbari said, who used to run Tata T, was very unhappy that Tomko was sold to Hindustan Lever because his main competitor was Hindustan Levers because he had beaten them in the tea business. And he could not understand why uh, the other businesses could not be given to him. Soap business could not be given to him to fight the same battle. But they, they sold it off. And they partly sold it off to cut the power of the managers. So they were very powerful managers in the group because they didn't have children. There were some um, four or five warlords, as I call them, you know, who actually controlled parts of the Tata Empire. Okay. And they were free to do what they wanted uh, in that sense. And when this man, the last guy, takes over the empire, there's a big tussle. He has to actually get rid of all the four guys and 
there is a fight to get rid of them. He puts a rule that there is a retirement age, they have to retire at 65 or something like that to get rid of them. And uh, so, and while his uh, uncle, who was the earlier head of the family, whom, whom I, whose quotation you saw, believed that you hire good managers and let them do run the company. As long as they are honest and, uh, and they are good, you should not interfere into that. Which also meant that each of them acted as a subgroup. So all the surplus from those companies was reinvested only within the network of those companies. So there was a steel group, and there was an automobile group, and there was a uh, this hotel group, and so on and so forth. So there were four or five very powerful warlords, okay, as famous as the the Tatas themselves, and. Uh, Yeah. So, so I think the, the, some of the answer is uh, this representative shareholders could have been the Darbari share, yeah. could have been anybody else, yeah. and it doesn't have to be Tata. Hmm. So why Tata's have to consolidate their control and remain the you know, representative shareholder is a question. That it could have been anybody else, but the name which was an intangible asset which couldn't be sold or couldn't have a market had, had something to do with the control the, that was uh, developed. And of course, the control and the governance that we hear is essentially fighting against another 800 pound gorilla called government, which of course is a very different problem than just looking to the manager shareholder conflict, that you have to maintain your independence from the government. So there is something else tussle going on. And they had, in that day, sometimes the manager was your ally, sometimes they were your enemy. So the different kind of governance problem. And I think that sort of is what is interesting about the scenario, because there is this other force called government, the public in general, the huge shareholders, they could exercise and you know, throw you out. So, that is a different kind of a uh, dimension of the problem, which is kind of not there in the US. You know, it's a different way manifested in China with this that different class of shareholdings, A shares and you know, yeah. the B shares and whatever. So it is that's so it is an interesting part I think is in the in the corporate governance uh, you know field rather than just the agency paradigm, which is which is somewhat different. What, what, what? I would like to yeah, take you back off the DJ's comment and something you said earlier that when I was in college, the whole idea of the protectionism and developing the nascent domestic sector was thought to be a bad idea. And of course, today people are reinterpreting it. This is not the first time that we have heard a comment to the effect that look, it was seed capital. And at that time, you just had to do it to create the base, right? Likewise, BK's comment, it seems to me that uh, back then the government had all of these weapons in its arsenal, but they were all product of the 1960s the policy where the government was putting in borrowing territory or putting in large amounts of money through IDBI, which is the Industrial Development Bank we heard about, IFCI, ICICI, and all of these corporations to allow the private sector to set up enterprises, but the private sector was basically cutting money out. All of these families that you saw, villas, market clubs, JK, going cuts, every single family. I've invested in their companies, and they, they've covered money out of companies that I've owned, and I've watched their rent of financial statements. They were all crooked, and the government assumed a lot of these powers to bring these people to heal. Yeah. And as you heard Professor Karna mention, the good managers were never hurt by the government. Government never stepped in and displaced one good management company, uh, because they knew they couldn't run the firm as well. So it's very interesting that the government was actually the representative shareholder's ally. It was only the family group's enemy when the family group was stealing from the other shareholders. That's also an interesting outcome, which is not much discussed in the governance literature, that by having superpowers, the government can actually come in and curb this tunneling behavior. And that's something that your comment reminded me of. This unique uh, structure that you have in India, from a foreign investor point of view, it seems according to the 
Wall Street Journal uh, article over the years, foreign investment has been exiting this. I think that's the reason because it is so foreign to us, looking at this structure that foreign capital is exiting the Indian market. Uh, let me put it this way. You know, 70% of foreign investment in India is a stock market, portfolio investments, which has not been exiting. It's still coming in. The, the boom in the stock market in India comes from foreign institutional investors, pension funds, and everybody investing. It's a direct investment in companies and so on, people who were setting up factories there, some of them have gone out. But the party is a very competitive market, and American firms have done very badly. Sorry to say that. The guys who have done well are the Koreans. Okay, they have really done well. And they have dominated certain sectors of the economy. So there are many foreign players in India. Unfortunately, the old British and the American firms have not been as successful as one expected them to be, except in some sectors. Even KFC, etc., Pepsi have been losing money. Not been a, been a tough market to enter. Okay. So I don't think they have been investing. Uh, the institutional investors invest in the Indian companies. And that money has been coming in. It's roughly $150 billion there, estimated investment in the stock market. It hasn't been going down. It has been going up all the time, every year. It's a direct foreign investment, which you're talking about, what we call FDI, which has fluctuated and might have might have been pulled out because many have just sold out and they out of India, finding it difficult to get lost, finding it difficult to penetrate that market. The automobile industry in India is dominated by Koreans and Japanese. Okay, all General Motors and everybody has done very badly there. The white goods market, LG and this is it. so there are other foreign players who are, who are there. Rather than Indian firms, and in many other sectors, Indian firms are very tough players. In pharmaceutical, for example, they are really aggressive. So there would be different sectors. It's a very competitive market, and I, I don't think that's the reason. I have a feeling that, that in some of the sectors, Americans are declining. As it, in automobile, I would say America is a declining power. The power has shifted back to East Asia to the Chinese and the Koreans who would be dominating the next 20 years. And they are dominating the Indian market also. Yeah. Even, even Japanese are not always really successful. Mm -hmm. I mean, Honda is a classic example. Yeah. There's a two wheelers. They just got beaten all over the Indian domestic manufacturers who geared up mm -hmm. and actually did much better. So you know, it's, it's a very tough market for the kind of market. It's not that the economy is not growing in India. It's hard to venture. So it's a, it's a, it's a different uh, challenge for the yeah, know, yeah. corporations to, to get in. So market is there. Oh sure. Yeah. No, but the, it's not. It is. A, it is. But the Honda is something that has beat everybody else elsewhere. They themselves got beaten in India. Couldn't do it. Yeah. So this, this is an interesting question. Is there something about the governance models because the Korean and Japanese, if you're, uh, I'm sorry, the Korean and Chinese firms are very very. Similar. Yeah. How is it that they motivate their managers to achieve this kind of success? Which really, the PK is right. Uh, they, other top firms have been able to do it. Well, I don't know that much about China, but in Korea, it's families. Yeah, families. In yeah, like it's, India. It's the same structure. Same so structure. It works same in both places. same structure, have, exactly. So, what about European companies, though? Have they been as successful? For example, many of them are family controlled. The Germans have been the most successful in, in machinery, you know. Okay. They dominate a large part of the market for most sophisticated machines, electrical and all that kind of a thing. Siemens and Alstoms and all that, they are, they are powerful players in India. Locomotives, those kinds of things. Uh, but uh, other uh, British firms have done badly, very badly. They have been taken over by Indians actually, most of the old British firms. Uh, French also have done not so well. Though initially they were quite aggressive in coming in, but they haven't done so well. But some of them, these uh, Europeans are also very big in armament production, joint ventures. Okay, Swedish firm, French firms, and all that. India is a large, one of the largest importers of arms in the world, 
and uh, now there is a local content requirement that if you buy arms from you, you must produce 30-40% in India with an Indian partner. So a lot of them are, European firms are there, because they are the, the leading. Earlier British, Americans would refuse to sell us arms and now they are very angry, they are not getting that. Well, the same problem with China, local content has been a big thing. Anyway, there are so many open threads that we invite you to come back again and talk to us and continue this conversation. But for today, time being limited, thank you. Thank you.